Now, for many of us, one of the most enjoyable things about the Liberty Weekend celebration was the music. Over those four days, we heard quite a range from Sousa marches to American opera to contemporary hits. And what it all had in common, in fact, what all American popular music has in common, is that its roots can be traced to every corner of the globe. Ours is the music of the melting pot. And like the statue we celebrated, it's been with us for a hundred years. How did it evolve into its present form? We asked Bob Brown to find out. <laughs> You want to try the one that we talked about? I should know it by now. Good. Me too. I'm gonna be a Yankee boy. My Uncle Sammy's pride and joy. I'm gonna strut down the street. Oh, that my feet. White bread and This is a rehearsal room on Lower Broadway in New York City, just south of the district that used to be known as Tin Pan Alley. For years, the melting pot of American music. Oh, say, can you see that Yankee boy? That's me. This tune, sung by actor Larry Kurt, may bring to mind those Tin Pan Alley days with its jingoistic Yankee Doodle flavor, but it was written for a new Broadway musical about that turn of the century period called Rags. Its composer is Charles Strauss, who also wrote the music for Annie, Bye Bye Birdie, and Applause, among other shows, and whose research for rags gave him special insight into that time when waves of immigrants were beginning to make their own contributions to American songs. What was interesting uh, about that time was a lot of musicians who Im immigrated, along with just regular people, farmers and, and the garment makers and all that, they were... Uh, uh, they were street musicians, very much like our street musicians, and the spirit that they brought uh, was very much like our rock and roll. But here, because of our immigrant society, it all grew together and, and cross-fertilized itself, and all over the world, it's been the largest uh, influence uh, uh, on other countries. It was all coming together in that same period that included the dedication of the Statue of Liberty, and the opening of this immigrant processing center on Ellis Island, American music was just beginning to take on the sounds and rhythms that would make it unique. It's important to remember that many of those special characteristics didn't come from immigrants who sought out this land, but from slaves who were brought here by force. African Americans who brought a scale that gave our music that moody or even chilling feeling that we associate with a kind of unsettled pitch you hear it when you play the third note on our do, re, mi scale, a little flat. That's the blue note, a note that gave the blues its soul and has since been incorporated into virtually every style of American popular music. And then there were the offbeat rhythms of ragtime, a form that fostered jazz. That was really the, the popular music of the day. You had this uh, kind of... Uh... Jazz pianist and musicologist Billy Taylor. The organization was really very much like what we know as a march form, what John Philip Sousa and people like that played. That sets up the pulse that uh, one can play, play these other kinds of rhythms on top of. So what you get is an overlay of rhythmic textures. So you have one set of rhythms. accents coming in funny places. Scores of musicians developed styles that sprang from ragtime. Willie the Lion Smith was one of them. The list also includes names like Fats Waller, James P. Johnson, U.B. Blake, Jelly Roll Morton, and eventually Irving Berlin and George Gershwin as composers with European roots began to harness elements of jazz into their popular tunes. There's some of all of us in American music, but the point is the American jazz was the semantic feature. and I think that's what, what gives it its great international appeal.
Here's just one example how this form of Eastern European folk music made the transition nicely into American jazz. One, two, three. <laughs> this is a group called the Klezmorum. The title refers to a type of music known as klezmer named for itinerant musicians who roamed Eastern Europe as long ago as the 16th century. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries came our huge influx of immigrants from Eastern Europe, and with them came the klezmer musicians who brought their own particular kind of sound. It was a wild, exotic, uh, highly improvised form of music, and uh, it was played in uh, the streets and in taverns and at uh, fairs and weddings, pretty much any place where people wanted to play music. What distinguishes the klezmer sound? Well, first, listen to the musical steps that form the kind of major chord we're most accustomed to hearing. You know, this is a major chord. Now listen to these musical steps. Even though it may not sound like it, they'll form the same major chord in the same key we just heard, but the way a klezmer musician would play it. And finally, listen to a klezmer tune called Der Stiller Bolgar, and you'll hear the origins of an American big band hit of the 1930s. They changed the rhythms, they changed the harmonies, they slowed it down, they added words to it. And then it became, and the angels sing. And the angels sing became a standard for trumpeter Ziggy Elman, but in some parts it was still Der Stiller Bolgar, note for note. growing up in a Jewish neighborhood in Chicago was heavily influenced by the sound. Klezmer was just one of the influences that went into the melting pot, of course. I was very aware of my Irish roots, even though I was very American, too. We used to get a little package sent to us every year from Ireland, from our relatives. It was a little package of dirt and a little package of uh, shamrocks to plant in the, in the Irish sod. So once a Country year, music star that. Eddie Rabbit was born and raised in this country, but Rabbit is an Irish name. And as this old photograph shows, the Rabbit family back in Ireland was a musical one. Rabbit's father, Tom, who is now 86 years old, emigrated here more than 60 years ago. And like many newcomers with musical ability, Tom Rabbit used his talents to make extra money where he could, entertaining within the immigrant community. There was a time when Tom Rabbit, playing his Irish jigs and reels as a new arrival in this country, attracted the same kind of attention from female fans that his son Eddie is familiar with today. One time he was playing so great that a lady came up from this Irish dance, uh, came up from the audience and... Uh, and she says, I'll wash your socks, she says, any day in the week. <laughs> Rabbit has never visited the land his father came from, but the Irish and the Scots laid the foundation for American country and folk music. And if you listen to the words Eddie Rabbit sings in a song he wrote for his father, you'll hear how country music still carries on that oral tradition the Irish love, a good first-person storytelling ballad. I can hear my daddy playing on the violin Jigs and reels that he brought from Ireland and I'm the firstborn in America, my friend. I like to turn a phrase in music and make it tearful and soulful. 
What strikes me about the Irish music is uh, there's something very deep and very green about it and uh, very beautiful, magical and mystical and all those kind of things. Uh, I feel like I'm tied to, tied to that place by uh, an invisible cord. And I just close my eyes and I can almost see Those shamrock hills and those forty shades of green And the roots that tie me to a land I've never known Are calling There was a freedom to it, and everybody contributed, and that was, uh, that's what's wonderful about it. And uh, I often believe that what grew out of it, this American music, it only could have happened here. Writing the Broadway score for Rags and listening for hours to recordings from that formative period in American music Composer Charles Strauss says he was struck by the variety of sounds that were introduced to each other then. African, European, Arabic, Middle Eastern tones, getting together with the blues. It's really American. I mean, it was just part of that, that melting down of, of, uh, of all these musical elements. Strauss borrowed from several of those sources to write his music because just as certain songs remind you vividly of periods in your life, there are those musical sounds rooted in periods of our history that are often as descriptive and evocative as any words a lyricist could add. As our songs continue to absorb and spread ideas from arriving immigrants, the strength of American pop music is that somehow, all those sounds wind up making sense together. That is so great that Bob Brown will be back with a musical footnote and to talk about all this when we come back. Mm -hmm.